August, and summer is uh, finally upon us, I think. And uh, so I, each summer I try to do kind of a, a different series because people come and go and are all over the place. And so we try to take some time um, away from kind of where we're normally preaching and do something different. And uh, this summer what I'm going to do, uh, what I've decided to do, and there's really no spiritual thing about it. I just decided <laughs> because I'm the preacher, so I get to do that. Um, I decided that we're going to do a series on the characters in Scripture. So we're going to do, each Sunday is going to be a different character, a different biographical sketch on a character in the Word of God. And I have called the series Characters of Grace because the dominant theme uh, through the series really is people that God uses, but it's not because they're strong or they're smart or they're mighty or they have some position of influence. It's simply humble people that God uses, uh, which I find tremendously encouraging because that's exactly where I am at. What do I have? I don't have anything special for the Lord, but God specializes in using people that nobody else would use or nobody would expect to use because it's those people that declare his glory. As I was thinking of the series, a uh, passage from 1 Corinthians came to my mind. Let me read it for you. It summarizes well kind of where we're going to be over the summer. Uh, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says in chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, he says, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So, why does he do it? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And the clear testimony of Scripture is that God is not looking for mighty people, and he's not looking for wise people, and he's not looking for uh, powerful people, because uh, in that case, the wisdom and the power tend to get in the way of God getting the glory. And God's looking for broken vessels. He's looking for people who are unwise and weak and common, so that when he does a work through them, everybody knows it was clearly God who did it. It wasn't them Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. And so our salvation is completely of God. Why? Because if we had a little part in it, then we would brag and boast about our little part. And just like our salvation is of God, so is our sanctification, so is our service. So that as we come today to rejoice in what God has done in Vacation Bible School, it's not about what we did, it's about what God did. And how God works and moves through his people. So it's my desire that we would be both encouraged and challenged as we hear testimonies and stories of those who've gone before us. And I have intentionally chosen uh, what we might call secondary characters in Scripture, not the primary ones, simply because, well, one of the reasons is because if you take David or Moses, it would take all summer to talk about them. There's so much on their lives. And, and I think there's a way we identify better with the secondary characters, don't we? Because we're all like, I'm no David, I'm no Moses. Uh, but some of the folks that are a little more on the outskirts of those stories, of those narratives, we maybe identify better with. So some of them, we only have a chapter and a whole Bible about them. Some of them, only a few chapters. We begin this morning by looking at the life of a woman. And, and the thing that sets her apart in the narrative is that she has no children. Now, this is true of several women in Scripture. They're barren and not able to have children. This particular woman we're going to look at lives at one of the lowest points in Israel's history as a nation. Uh, two verses summarize the state of the nation at that time. Judges 21-25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then in 1 Samuel 3, verse 1, it says, And the word of God was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And so the, the, the setting is this. Evil is rampant in the land, and the word of God is rare. I can't help but see the parallel to our own day. Evil is rampant, and the word of God is rare in the land. And as we'll see as we go through, it's not just that the word of God was rare in the land. The word of God was even rare at the temple, the tabernacle itself. And it's into this scene we meet a lady by the name of Hannah. 
So would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We read of Hannah really in just these first two chapters of the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse number 1, we read the following. There was a certain man of Rathiam Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the first was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 3, Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray this morning. Father, uh, the song that we have just sung in preparation for this this morning is really a prayer. Speak, O Lord. And that's our heart's desire. Lord, we read of a time in Israel when the word of God was rare, and our prayer is that that not, would not be so here this morning, that we as your people would come with a heart um, open and ready to receive your truth. Uh, we would say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. We want to know you. We want to follow you. We want to understand your will for our lives. So God, help us as we search your truth. Help us as we look at the, at the brief picture of Hannah's life and the legacy that she leaves for us to walk in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're first introduced in our text here to a man named Elkanah, and he's a Levite, and he lives in the land of Ephraim, and he has two wives, Hannah and Penina. And the account here largely focuses on Hannah. We learn several things about Hannah in the verses that I just read. The first thing we learn is that she has no children. Uh, now, this is a very significant statement. Anyone in Israel at the time who was reading this portion of Scripture, uh, that would mean something to them. It would mean a couple of things. The first, uh, they would assume God's judgment on Hannah. Uh, the Bible is very clear that children are a blessing to the Lord. And so in Israel, it was viewed, if you had children, you were blessed by God, which is true. But the, the unbiblical thought was that if you have no children, then God is somehow judging you for that. And so the, the cultural context on Hannah and the view from society, people looked on Hannah, there was something wrong with Hannah. Hannah was clearly out of favor with God because children were a blessing from the Lord and God had not blessed her with any. Now that's not true, that's not a biblical thought, but that's the, the predominant thought of the time. Now the second thing that's significant about that is that they're living in a day and age, there's no social security. So it's the children that care for the parents. Specifically, the, the husband is often older than the wife. Uh, men would typically marry late 20s, early 30s. Women in, often in their teens. And so it's very common for the husbands to die first, leaving the wife. But in that culture, the wives don't work. The women don't work. And so their uh, support after their husband dies is dependent on their children. So when we say that Hannah has no children, it means that who is there to care for Hannah when uh, Elkanah would pass away? And so Hannah has no children. We learn that Hannah, though, does have a godly husband. A godly husband. Despite all Israel doing what was right in their own eyes, notice Elkanah, what he does. He takes his wives and his children to the tabernacle to worship God. It was instructed in the law that the men were to go to the tabernacle three times a year. And so we see here Elkanah fulfilling that responsibility and not only himself going, but taking his family with him. And then you, you add to that, you notice the text specifically mentions the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas were priests that served at the temple. They were evil, wicked men. 
uh, they did not serve God. They, uh, as we read later on in the pa- later on in the text, a few chapters away, uh, they would um, they were dishonest about how they served the people. They brought in uh, prostitution into the temple, uh, into the tabernacle. It was a place of debauchery and sin. But despite that, Elkanah still came. Why? Because the, temper, the tabernacle was where the presence of God was. And so despite the priest's disobedience, Elkanah still came. And he came to offer sacrifices to God, even though those people were there. We also learn about Hannah here that she was loved by her husband. Uh, It's likely from the text, although it's not stated explicitly, that Hannah was Elkanah's first wife. And he married Penina because Hannah did not have any children. Um, Now, we will talk about uh, polygamy in a a couple weeks um, because it tends to hit a few stories in the Old Testament. God does not condone that anywhere in Scripture. And we see here the problems that even come from that. But Elkanah loved Hannah. Despite the fact that she did not have any children, he still loved her. And and that is made clear in the text. Verse 5, Hannah, he gave a double portion to Hannah because her loved her, even though the Lord had closed her womb. And so again, culturally, Hannah would be pushed aside because clearly she is out of favor with God. But Elkanah didn't do that. Elkanah loved his wife. He would give her that to sacrifice and to worship God. Conversely, though, we learn here that Hannah was persecuted by Penina, the other wife. I mean, Hannah was already grieved over the fact that she had no children, and Penina loved to rub that in her face. You can only imagine the tension in this home and the relationships that existed here. A very, very difficult situation. But we learn something very key in verse 5 and verse 6. We learn that Hannah's barrenness is not a result of her own sin, but in fact, it's by the sovereign hand of God on her life. Now you notice that the writer of 1 Samuel points that out twice. Why? Because again, the assumption would be that something's wrong with Hannah. Hannah is out of favor with God. But the writer wants to make clear, no, Hannah is not out of favor with God. In fact, we might say this, Hannah's in favor with God. God has specifically chosen Hannah for some reason, we're not given that, to not have children at this time. It's because God is working in her life, the exact opposite of what people would think in the world, in the the cultural context. God had a plan for Hannah, and that plan included at this point being barren. We're not told why, but it's clear it's of God. And yet, the last thing we see here about Hannah is that Hannah is struggling greatly under the burden of this. Even though it's by the sovereign hand of God, Hannah is struggling greatly. Now, again, we read between the lines here a little bit. Uh, Hannah has been struggling with this for years. Presumably she married Elkanah and they tried to have children for a few years and it didn't happen. Penina, and then he married Penina. She has several children. So we're talking a decade, possibly two decades that it has been, that Hannah has had to bear this burden of not having any children. She is grieved. The burden that God has called her to bear is almost too great for her. And I think here, this is Hannah's example to us. She shows us what to do in this place. right? What do we do when God is silent? What, what do we do when life is hard? And, and, and not just when God is silent in the moment or life is hard in the moment, but, but when that prolongs itself. And it, and it turns from days to weeks and weeks to months and months to years. And we pray to God and God just does not seem to answer. When, when the burden just does not seem to be removed. When God doesn't seem to, to, to quell those doubts and the burden only seems to get greater. What do we do in those moments? And that's where I think Hannah gives us a great example to follow. The first example that Hannah has for us here is that we are to be persistent and passionate in prayer. Persistent and passionate in prayer. Follow along with me, verse number 9 in our text. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son that I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. 
Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away the wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped God, worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked of him from the Lord. God is sovereign, and, and that sovereignty, and again, again, is seen in the passage here by the fact that Hannah is barren, that she does not have any children, and the writer is clear to point that it's by the sovereign hand of God. And yet, even though God is sovereign, that does not mean that we cannot plead our case before him or that circumstances will not change. And in fact, I would argue it's exactly because God is sovereign that drives Hannah to him. Hannah understands that God is in control, and thus he is the only one who can do anything about her circumstance. Notice verse 12, it says, Hannah continued to pray. So this isn't just like a one-time experience for Hannah, where she just showed up and she, this time she decided to pray. Hannah has been praying for, for years and years and years. She has been faithful to pray. Even though God has yet to answer her prayer, she keeps praying. She continues to go before Him. The fact that Hannah continues to call out to God shows her trust in Him. She's confident that God hears her and thus she will continue to call on Him. God is Hannah's only hope and so she will go to Him and go to Him and go to Him. Hannah, Hannah here is not only persistent, but she is passionate in her prayer. So moved is Hannah in making her prayer to God that Eli the high priest mistakes her for being drunk. I mean, have, have you ever prayed so passionately that somebody thought you were intoxicated because you were praying? I mean, that tells us something about the, the depth and passion of her prayer. I mean, it also tells us something about the spiritual condition of Israel, doesn't it? The high priest is literally sitting at the doors of the temple, and his first assumption is she's drunk. Clearly, he's not used to seeing people pray in the temple, in the house of the Lord. And yet Hannah bears her heart before him. Verse 16 says, Hannah is moved deeply, and she cries out of her great anxiety and vexation. Hannah lays hold of the throne of grace and she pleads her case before God. She bears her soul to God. She empties her heart at the throne of grace. Uh, note, she's not irreverent. She's not even uncontrolled. She is deliberate. She's passionate in her prayer to God. And her persistence and her passionate prayer are an act of faith. It's trusting that God hears. It's trusting that God will answer. The psalmist in Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Uh, then in the New Testament, the Apostle Peter says, in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Brother and sister, if you find yourself in that place in life where the burden drags on, where God is silent, where you don't know if you can carry on, do not give up in prayer. Continue to go to God. Continue to pour out your heart and soul to Him. You see, when, when the trial prolongs, when there doesn't seem to be any relief, we're tempted to do a couple of things. One, we're tempted to give up. Because we live in an instant society, right? Pop it in the microwave, you got your food. We, we want answers now. And we come to God and we pray to God and God doesn't answer and we assume, I guess he's not going to answer. Hannah teaches us that's not true. And in fact, another interesting example in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 1, 
We meet a couple by the name of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Zechariah and Elizabeth are also barren, and they're past the years of having children. And, and you remember, this, we go over this at Christmas time often, and Luke chapter 1, angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah. Notice the words he says, Gabriel says to Zechariah. He says this, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Zechariah and Elizabeth had not given up on prayer. Even in their age, they had continued to pray before God. And the angel Gabriel comes from heaven and he says, what? Your prayer's been heard. God Almighty heard your prayer. He didn't answer it in your time or in your way, but God has heard your prayer. So brother, sister, don't give up. Don't give up when the way is hard. Don't give up when God seems to be silent. Continue to go to him and lay your burdens at his feet. Hold fast to the throne of grace that you may find help in your time of need. The second thing I think we're tempted to do when the trial prolongs is that we're, we're tempted not to empty all of our soul. Uh, the psalmist said, and Peter says, cast your burden on the Lord. But I think we're tempted at times to sort of half cast our burden. We don't fully cast our burden on the Lord. We kind of give him a little bit, but for good measure, we like to hang on to a portion of it just so that, you know, we have something to hold on to. But Hannah here empties her soul to God. She, she puts everything on the throne before him. She is earnest in her prayer. In the book of Acts in chapter uh, 12, uh, there's been a reprieve from persecution for the early church and, and the church is growing and things seem to be going well. Uh, but for some reason, Herod takes the apostle James and puts him in prison and Herod executes James. And it seems to come out of nowhere. There's this time of peace and all of a sudden James is dead and, and, and Herod realizes it made the Jews happy. So he grabs Peter and he throws Peter in prison. He's gonna do the same to Peter. But we read this in Acts 12, verse 5. Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer was made to him by God. Uh, brothers and sisters, the challenge for us is that we laid hold to the throne of grace, that God would answer our prayers. The psalmist says in Psalm 62, verse 8, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And I think Hannah kind of shows us what happens when we do that. Notice of verse 18. Um, after she has poured out her soul to God, she's no longer sad. She worships God in verse number 19 because there is a confidence that God has heard her. Now, now Eli has said to her, Go your way, your prayer will be answered. Okay, but it will be weeks, if not months, before she knows if that's true. She's going in the faith, trusting that God has heard her prayer. She has emptied her soul before him. And we read in the text that God in his mercy does what? After years of praying, God in his mercy finally answers Hannah's prayer. Hannah finally gives birth to a baby boy, and she calls his name Samuel. Now, do you know why? Did you see in the text why? End of verse number 20. She calls his name Samuel because she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. We see this beautiful picture all the way through these two chapters. Hannah's heart desire is to honor God. It's not a selfish request. Her, her desire is to exalt God. And, and we see that. And the question now that hangs uh, at the end of verse 20 is, we just read that Hannah made this vow that she is going to give Samuel back to the Lord. And now after years of praying, she finally has a son. And the question is, what will she do? Will she respond? Will she keep her vow? Well, we see the persistence uh, and passionate prayer. Next, we see in Hannah's life, joyful obedience Joyful obedience, follow in verse number 21. It says, uh, The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, uh, with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. 
And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He has lent to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. Joyful obedience. The text doesn't give us an age. But it says, Hannah says, I'll wait until after I've weaned him. In, in the Hebrew culture here, it be, uh, there wasn't things like formula and stuff that we have. And so they would often breastfeed their children as long as they could, which often mean to about three years of age. So Samuel's about three, maybe five years old. And he is taken to the temple and he is left there to be raised by Eli. <laughs> Mums, can you imagine? Can you imagine doing that? Your only child, the child you have prayed for for years, to take that child and give him back to God. There's no indication in the text that Elkanah or Hannah hesitate in keeping that vow. And just as a side note here, that the, the text is on Hannah, but notice Elkanah goes along with this. Right? He's in support of this. This child is just as much hers. In fact, Hannah's the one who made the vow. Elkanah is the husband. He could have vetoed it. He could have said, I don't think so. But no, he goes along. He too offers his son Samuel to the Lord. Uh, how do we know that it was joyful obedience here? Well, a few things indicate. Verse number 24, you see uh, the joy and the sacrifice. And so uh, Numbers 15 uh, in the law, they're given um, a certain sacrifice they're supposed to offer when they fulfill a vow. And the offering that is brought here is above and beyond what God asked in Numbers. And so we don't see here a reluctance from Hannah to fulfill her vow. We see her coming with abundance over than what God asked to fulfill her vow to God. We see her commitment. Notice no strings attached. Verse 22, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Verse 28, therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives, he is to the Lord. She's not just lending him for a month or a couple years. Or Eli, when you're done with him, send him back. There's no coming back. He's gone. And we see her joy and her praise. Chapter 2 opens with a wonderful, beautiful song of praise that Hannah sings. And it mirrors a couple other songs in Scripture. Uh, David sings a very similar song in 2 Samuel 22. And it even draws parallels to Mary's song in Luke chapter 2 of praise to God for all that he has done. Hannah's life shows us what it looks like to joyfully obey God even when it costs us something. Jesus says in John 15, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Hannah knew this joy and you and I can know this joy too. Hannah knew her place as a servant of God. Both her barrenness and her children belong to the Lord. And the joy that we see here comes from doing God's will. It doesn't mean life will be easy. It doesn't mean life will be fun. But it means that we know we're living for that which is eternal. We are sacrificing and giving ourselves to something that will last forever. Do you know that joy in your life? Do you know that kind of lasting joy, the joy of obedience to God? I can't help but wonder the impact of Hannah's obedience on Samuel. I mean, we think of Hannah leaving him there. What was it like for Samuel? Three-year-old, five-year-old Samuel to be taken and left in the temple. Now you would think as a parent, well, if you're going to leave your child somewhere, I mean, the house of God would be a good place to leave him. But we already know from the context that this is not a good place to leave a son. The priests of God are evil and wicked, so evil and wicked that God will kill them. Eli, the high priest himself, has not heard from God in years. In fact, when God wants to speak, he's going to speak through Samuel because Eli won't listen to God anymore. So you imagine you're leaving your child in that kind of place. And yet, if we continue to read the book of Samuel, you can make the case that through the prophet Samuel, God single-handedly turns the nation back to himself. Where did Samuel's heart for the Lord come from? I can't help but think of the impact that every time Samuel saw his parents, he was reminded of what true obedience looks like. 
And so we read of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord had revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So our joyful obedience in God is not just impact on ourselves. When we joyfully follow God's word, it impacts those around us. As parents, the challenge on us here is great. Now, just because we joyfully follow God doesn't mean our children will. And we are going to see that in coming weeks. This is not a guarantee. It's not a, it's not a formula. You do this right and it will all happen right. No. In fact, Samuel is a great prophet of the Lord. And we'll read that his own children do not follow God. And God rejects his own children. But Hannah and Elkanah, we see a faithful picture of joyful obedience to God. May we be the people of God who joyfully do God's will and spur one another on to love and good works. The last thing in Hannah's life here as we, as we close, uh, I want to look at Hannah's faith in the promise of God. So she is persistent and passionate in prayer. She has joyful obedience. And then she has faith in the promise, singular, of God. I'm not going to read all of Hannah's prayer in her song in, ver in chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at that briefly tonight. But I do want to read the very last verse. So uh, 1 Samuel 2 and verse 10. Uh, she prays, this is the end of her song. She says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will exalt, uh, excuse me, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Uh, Hannah's song is full of wonderful theology and, and, and great uh, understanding of who God is. But there's something in verse 10 that stands out, something that I didn't notice until I started studying it, something that actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, she says, she says that uh, she praises that God will give strength to the king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, on one hand, that's not uncommon because if you go to the Psalms, that's often the case. The psalmist would, would praise God or praise the king and want the king to be exalted. The king was God's anointed. And so wanting the king to succeed and follow God was a good thing. But what do we know about Israel at this time? Israel doesn't have a king. They've never had a king. There's never been a king in Israel. In fact, Samuel will be the one to anoint the first king, Saul, and that will likely probably be after Hannah's death. So Hannah here speaks of a king and of an anointed one, but it's not the king of Israel because Israel doesn't have a king. Who is it then that Hannah speaks of? Hannah speaks of the seed that was promised to Eve. The seed that would come to Eve that would reverse the curse. The seed that was promised to Abraham and Sarah that would be a blessing to all nations. Hannah, by faith, sees beyond her circumstances and, and somehow sees that her son will play a part in God's bigger, greater plan far beyond the immediate. Hannah's hope is firmly anchored in the one who would come Hannah's hope is anchored in the promised Messiah. As much as she wanted a son, her hope and faith rested not, on the, rested not on the earthly son, but in the heavenly son who would come. Now, we know who this king is. We know who this anointed one is. He's Jesus. And Hannah didn't know that. She didn't know his name. She didn't know all that we know. We're on this side of the cross. We have God's full revelation. Hannah didn't have all of that. She just knew that God had promised to send one. And that one would be the one who, to reverse the curse, to be the blessing promised through Abraham. We see here the true source of Hannah's strength and faith. She's not just concerned with the circumstances of her own life, but she understood that her problems were seen in terms of a much larger story of history. Hannah's faith is defined by looking forward to the king, by looking forward to the anointed one, just as our faith looks back. Our faith looks back to the king who came the king who, who gave his life for us on the cross. The cross is what we daily refocus our lives on. The cross gives meaning to our problems and hope to our future. See, it's the cross that we see we have victory over our burdens. We know that they will not last forever, that we will be with God for all eternity. And it's the cross that gives purpose to our suffering. 
It shows us who God is. So just as God was working in the bleakest moments of Israel's history, so God is working in our day, and he's working in your life and in mine. Our persistent, passionate prayers and our joyful obedience are a testimony that the king has come and that he's coming back again. So this morning, if you, like Hannah, you find yourself carrying that heavy burden, you find yourself in that place where God seems silent, where it seems like I can't carry this burden anymore, where it continues to go on and go on and on, what does Hannah teach us? Hannah teaches us first to pray to be persistent in prayer, to be passionate in prayer, to go to the throne of grace until you receive help in your time of need. At times, sometimes we don't know what to pray. The burdens of our heart are so great. We're like Hannah, the lips move, but nothing comes out. At that time, the word of God can be a great comfort to us to go to the Psalms and the Psalms can speak for us or to go with other believers and together to bring our petitions before the Lord as the early church did, as they gathered in Acts 12 and they made earnest prayer for Peter. Pray persistently and passionately. Secondly, then serve. Serve not for a reward in this life, but serve for a reward for all eternity. Have your eyes looking beyond this world. And lastly, keep your eyes on Jesus. May our faith be in the promise, the one who is in control, the one who loves, and the one who is coming back. We're going to close the service this morning with It Is Well With My Soul. And I thought it was a very fitting song in light of what we talk about here. It was well with Hannah's soul because she was persistent in her prayer and because she joyfully obeyed and because her faith was on him. And so too, just our circumstances of life may not be all wonderful, but we, it can be well with our soul if our faith and our eyes are on Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for Hannah. Hannah lived and walked this earth. She was like we are. She was a sinner in need of grace. And God, she found that grace and she found help at your throne. God, she knew you. I pray that we too would know you, that we would know the joy of following you, and that you would help us, like Hannah, to have our eyes lifted beyond this life and beyond these circumstances, God, uh, to a glorious future that awaits us. In Jesus' name, amen.